Well, hello everyone. We are uh, in the midst of, uh, I guess it's the middle part of, of April and, and we're in the middle of the um, COVID-19 pandemic crisis. And, you know, we're beginning to hear rumblings. It, it, you know, I don't know when you're going to watch this and maybe it's years from now, but just to give you a, a frame of reference where my mind is, um, we've just been told that that President Trump is considering um, trying to boost the economy again, get it jump started. Um, there's still some pockets of um, serious um, things going on as far as the virus is concerned. And, you know, depending on who you talk to and who you listen to, their concerns are different things. Of course, the president's going to be worried about the economy and, and how many people are are you know, the death rate and the different, um, the cases that are reported from state to state. But, but when you get down to normal, regular people, we're worried about when's baseball going to start? Um, are we going to have a football season? Uh, when can I shop again? When can I go to the restaurants? Everybody's wondering when we can get back to what we call normal. And it raised a question in my heart. And as I considered it, I realized maybe it was one of those God questions. And so I, I kind of, you know, dove into it and was trying to, one thing you got to understand when you feel like God's asking you a question, he's not really asking you a question. He's, he's wanting you to ask the question. So that's really my, my meditation was, okay, God, can you speak to me and help me to see this from, from your perspective? And, and I was wondering and this is not going to be real popular with those of us that, that want to go outside of our homes. But I'm thinking, has this had enough effect to where when it's over, will we not just go right back to our old? Because what, what everybody is, is beginning to see as you, you know, pay attention to your social media and different things are brought out. Uh, folks are getting so creative and people are actually going towards the Lord and seeking the Lord. I know our um, views are up on all of our um, different broadcasts and, and different things. And everybody's telling me that, you know, oh yeah, my, my friend was looking for something and they watched and, you know, they normally just watch their own minister or their favorite minister, but he will have more time. So, you know, you're, they're more spiritually in tune and, and inclined. So I've been thinking about that and, and wondering what has it been long enough to where, you know, they say that it takes at least 30 days to develop a habit and you read different things of what's been going on. Has it been long enough to where people are coming to the end of themselves and then end of what they normally do? I know I went back to work this week and, and what I heard from some of my coworkers were they were concerned that they had gained a lot of weight because they were sitting around and some of them confessed, I've drank more this last month than I ever have. And my, and my kids think I'm a drunk, you know, all the you just sit there and you bite your tongue. And so I've been thinking about, you know, you, I remember a lot of the prophetic voices and myself, I sensed that this was a year that there was going to be a monumental shift and there was going to be some, you know, a, a wide uh, ranging move of God. And here we, you know, we're in the middle of April and I still believe that's true. I know that around our circles, we've been thinking about the word shift long before you were reading about it in the Elijah list and hearing about it in charisma magazines and different people. Uh, my wife had a, a dream about shift. What was it? It was a swift shift switch. Uh, it was like an angelic messenger whispered that in her ear. And there's a lot of different details to that dream, but we have been analyzing and, and we've been inclined to, to look for and have our hearts geared towards this shifting. And so the, the question that came up in my mind was, what has to shift? Because you read when people are writing about the shifting that they're sensing, they, they speak about what they see shifting. But I think what God was trying to get me to consider is, what's the main thing that has to shift? What's the impetus that creates the widespread shift? What has to shift for everything else to follow suit? And 
as I meditated on it, I realized that a lot has been said about this. We're coming into a time where the hearts of the fathers are turned to the children and in turn, the hearts of the children are turned to the fathers. And we realize that that is not just speaking about the nuclear family, which it is speaking to that. It's speaking to real dads being leaders of, of their homes and dads and moms being, and, and spiritual fathers and spiritual mothers being leaders and that their heart will be towards their children. And, you know, off and on, you know, anybody that's been around for a while can say that, you know, my heart was towards my children, but they never in turn turned their heart towards me and I was I've always been looking forward to the time that that would happen when the generations would come into a unified you know relationship with the Lord but as I've been thinking about this I realized it's it's also and in this instance really speaking to spiritual leaders and I know in my time that I've had more of I felt led, and I, you know, this is one of those things where you feel led to do certain things, but you don't know why until afterwards. And then you look back, oh, that's why. And I've felt like I've had more time and I wanted to go on YouTube and look at some of, of the older prophetic people and the older teachers and hear what they're saying now to their congregations or to the people that they're, you know, allowed to speak to and listen to their blogs and read things and, and um, because we have to honor those that came before. And what I've come away with is they, for the most part, they're seeing the same things, but there has to start a repentance, a change of mind in the generals. Because I'm reading things and I'm seeing them teach things but they're not teaching them through the lens of grace. We're, we have one foot in Moses' house and one foot in Jesus' house. And I know I did a teaching a few years ago based out of Hebrews chapter 3 that where it says that Moses was faithful in his house as a servant, but Jesus in his house as a son. And the comparison nature of the book of Hebrews. And as it says... Jesus was faithful in his house as a son. It says, whose house we are. And I believe that what we need to do, and today what I want to do is something very, very practical, but I'm, I'm trying and, and uh, I have this inclination and this, I feel like a burden from the Lord to be respectful and not be critical, but just be instructional as I feel like God's given me an insight as to what this unification needs to be, what it needs to look like so that we're all speaking and saying the same thing. I can't imagine being either a baby Christian or a seeker looking for God in this environment when you can go onto YouTube and you can hear everything under the sun and no one's saying the same thing and they got to think what in the world is this is this about you know when we talk about a, a shift and you hear these phrases about the great awakening and if you have any idea of what those things mean historically to the church you know that and, 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 you know, you read this now, they're, they're speaking of this could be the third or depending on who you're talking to, the fourth great awakening. And it occurred to me, well, if you have more than one awakening, then evidently somebody went back to sleep. And when you look back at Bible history, you realize what that's describing as an awakening was just like in our culture now. I know I'm surrounded by people that don't know the Lord. I, I'm surrounded by people that at one time were in church but are not, and now they're wondering, is, is this true or is this just somewhere my parents made me go? And so we are in a world right now that we're hopeful is in, in the midst of a change. But I don't know about you guys and these that are sitting around me, but I know people that are wondering if God's even real. 
And the church, by and large, is not producing anything to convince them that there actually is one. To them, it just looks like a bunch of people that sometimes get along and sometimes don't. And, you know, they meet in these these big buildings but they come out and they just none of them agree you got a different church on every block and and so I think what has to happen if this is going to be the great awakening that that everyone is sensing and myself included this is the one that's going to be bigger than any other this is the one where the it's not going to just be within the four walls of the church but it's going to go out and affect all of society then there has to be some type of shift in the thinking of the generals and th- see what's funny is as you listen to some of these guys that that again I revere I honor because without them we wouldn't be to where we are but we have to always stay humble even those that have been around a while and teachable and realize that if we had it all figured out we would be a lot further than where we were and where we are and maybe there's something that needs to take place in our understanding that could unlock this whole thing and and I believe what it is is the understanding that grace is Jesus covenant and that even when, you know, you have so many differing opinions, oh, the Old Testament's not for today. Well, of course it is. But those of that I have sitting around me right now, they've heard me say this dozens of times, but it was drummed into me, and I, I saw it as a truth, and this has saved my life. This truth has kept me on track and kept things straight for me and has kept my mind in such a way that I'm, I'm teachable by Holy Spirit. We know the Holy Spirit only teaches those things that come freely from God. Holy Spirit always bears witness of Jesus. But so many times we'll go into the Old Testament and we'll take a scripture and just plunk it out. And what we're doing is we're bearing witness of Moses. And Holy Spirit teaching is always to bear witness of Jesus. So... Today, I just want to give one example, and again, maybe this is the third time, but I want to be very careful as to not dishonor, but maybe bring some correction, and I just pray for humility in, in myself and the hearers, and, and who knows, maybe we'll look back at, at this and say, well, he was right on this part, but he was wrong on this part, but bless his heart, he was trying, so, you know, I don't know about you guys, but you know there are a lot of people that are afraid and and out of a sincere desire to help we go back to scriptures that we have found a source of comfort and i've seen on twitter different times and and different things as joy flips through her facebook and i'm looking over her shoulder i'll see different mentions of second chronicles chapter 7 and you may not know what that is off the top of your mind, Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, but by the t- if you've been in church any length of time, or your Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, whatever, uh, you have at least a couple Christians on there, you've heard this verse before. And as, as I say it, you'll recognize it. it. It goes like this. This is Second Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14 it says if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then i will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land key words if and when sounds very conditional so it sounds very old testament can we take that scripture and can remember I've always told you guys maybe I didn't say this before run it by the cross you go to an Old Testament concept and you have to see how it fits with the cross you have to see whether the cross has made it better than what you're reading because anything under the old covenant has been made better if it was a promise under the old covenant Jesus made it better 
Hebrews chapter 8 says what? It says that, but now, this is Hebrews 8, 6, but now he, Jesus, has obtained a more excellent ministry, in this comparison to Moses, but now Jesus has obtained a more excellent ministry in as much as he is also mediator of a better covenant which was established on better promises. We have a better covenant, better promises. So when you see something that says if and when, if and then, you hear that it's conditional so you realize that I've just told you, Holy Spirit teaches those, those things that come freely from God. So when you see if and then, or if and when, you realize that there might be something in that, that yes, you still hold on to it, but you have to run it through the cross and see, it could be, have been enhanced. It could be made better. So what we need to do is rather than just pull a scripture that, that, it is a good scripture to hold on to and encourages us. What they're trying to do is encourage us to pray. Of course we need to pray. But it implies when you say, if my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear. What that implies is, then I'm not going to hear is that new covenant he said I, I was always taught new covenant meant i'll never leave you nor forsake you i'll always be with you even to the end of the age see we have to we have to be careful how we make these implications when we're taking these scriptures and teach them in light of new covenant and get really excited about this is even better than this and it's saying if you'll seek my face a lot of times, a lot of what we're calling prayer and even the national prayer movements that are being called out now, the implication is we have to all get together and beg God to, to fix this virus. When Jesus said we're supposed to speak to our mountains, all authority has been given to me, now you go therefore. That's implying that we now have a position we know who we are in christ but we have to make sure our doctrines the things that we're teaching line up with who we are in christ christ is the beginning of everything and you can't i mentioned a little while ago hebrews 3 what we've done is we've put people in two houses and they can't find their shirt and they don't know which house to go to i mean that's where the confusion is. Is he for me? Is he against me? Do I have to do something to get him to do something? Do I have to do something so well to get? It's as if we've got God on a string and based on our performance, he'll, oh, jump through this hoop, God. Okay, I'm doing good this week. Well, I did bad, so he's not with me. It can't be that way. So I said all that to show you this. In context, you understand what's going on in this scripture in context? I don't know about you, but I've heard this scripture taught dozens of times, but I never really knew what was going on in the context. The context is very interesting. He's speaking this to a man named Solomon. Solomon, earlier in this chapter, of course, this is verse 14, Solomon has just dedicated the temple. It was the, the paramount thing that Solomon did in this whole ministry was he was able to, to build the temple that his father, David, longed to build. And so David set him up. David had everything laid out ready for him to do. But if you recall, Solomon had a dream when he was first placed into office. He was a young, young teenage boy. He had a dream. And in the dream, God said, what do you want of course i'm paraphrasing he said what do you want and in a dream solomon had a good response he had wisdom to respond right even before he asked for wisdom and he said i want wisdom to judge between right and wrong with these people he's basically saying i i, I don't know how to be king even though i watch my daddy i i don't know. and you know if david was ever failed in anything 
paramount was he, he was not a good father why because he didn't have a good father you know he learned how to be a king he watched Saul and he some learned what not to do and what to do but it never seemed like he mastered how to be a good father David I'm sorry I hope when I see you, you don't you know bring this up but Solomon asked for the wisdom to discern right and wrong between the people he wanted to be a good king because he understood he's here on this earth and he needed natural wisdom and we know by the story that he received wisdom above anybody that ever was ever would be Solomon was wise but his wisdom was based on earthly natural thinking he didn't have the insight and the knowledge of God that his father had the entire new covenant it says in Romans that was based on the sure mercies of David blessed is the man whose sins are covered blessed is the man who even when he does sin they're not held in an account against him Solomon received wisdom of do good get good do bad get rejected and how did Solomon's life end even though he received he was the wisest man he could not do good all the time and he ended up at the end of his life ready to just quit he built a good temple spent a lot of money and a lot of slave hours doing it so in the beginning of this chapter in second chronicles chapter 7 the fire came down and consumed the sacrifice the temple was dedicated you had all the singers and you had all the priests and everybody was in their place and they had dedicated the temple there was a temple back in jerusalem and it was a great day and in verse 12 i, I told you verse 14 let's just cut to the chase and i'll go to verse 12 this is right after all this has happened. It says, then the, Lord, uh, then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night in a dream. This is Solomon's second dream. For all of you folks that think God has a limited way of speaking just through the word of God, that's one of the things that, that is shifting. We're realizing that God not only speaks to leadership, but he speaks to regular people too. And sometimes he likes to do it in dreams. Sometimes he likes to do it through, his, through your children. There's a lot of different ways God's speaking. But in this instance, God appears to Solomon again in a dream. And this is the second time. The first time was the one I just told you about. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer. What prayer was that? He just dedicated the temple and have chosen this place this temple for my for myself as a house of sacrifice what does a sacrifice do it appeases or pleases god the old testament sacrifices was what made them right with god are we still under that system <laughs> no that's verse 12 we're just trying to get to verse 14 so you can kind of see this is probably not for us can you know all together we've got this but it's better so then the lord appeared to solomon by night and said to him i have heard your prayer have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice when i shut up heaven and there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray do you see the context here not probably a good time to bring this scripture up right now because you get these millennials that they've been trained to look behind the scenes they've been trained to not just take everyone's word for everything thank god that they're not just little sheep that if you've got nothing to hide then you can tell them the concept you can give them the context we should not be teaching this scripture in the light of this setting because out of our mouths we'll say oh no god didn't send this plague but when they go back to check why we should humble ourselves and pray they say well yeah god sends pestilence right here it's right there in the bible you can see why they could be really confused not realizing that the cross changed everything we have a better covenant 
better promises. Why is it better? Because Jesus met all the conditions. It was still conditional. The first covenant was very conditional based upon their ability to please or appease. They had to do the good things and not do the bad things to stay in the covenant. Well, Jesus' covenant was actually harder. He had to keep all the old covenant. And then he had to die. He had to be the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the whole world. We have a better covenant, better promises. We should live only in Jesus' house. If we've got a foot and a mind, I'm saying foot, but if our mind is in both houses, no wonder the world's confused when we speak. The house of God has got to get unified with the Spirit of God, the Spirit of grace, the Holy Spirit that always bears witness of Jesus, not Jesus and Moses. The Holy Spirit always bears witness of Jesus. Moses was only pointing to Jesus. The Holy Spirit bears witness of Jesus and teaches us those things that come freely from God. In the Old Covenant, nothing was free. You earned everything. And what we're doing, we're talking out of both sides of our mouth. And the leaders, the ones that we look to for wisdom, have got to embrace the wisdom of God. We have got to embrace the spirit of truth. Jesus is the, is the truth, the way, and the life. There's no way to the Father but by Him. Jesus is the truth. He's the only way that we, we have to hold fast to what the Spirit of God is always bearing witness of Jesus. So, if my people who are called by my name were called by His name, Let's look at it. Let's just by, by illustration, let's just look at it. What would it look like in a new covenant setting? If my people, well, under the old covenant, you were his people one minute and the next minute he was sending you pestilence and plague. If my people who are called by my name, well, under Jesus' covenant, we have his name forever. Our identity is completely by him. You see, we have to allow our identity in Christ to govern everything we believe. It has to be Jesus, the cornerstone. You set the cornerstone and the building has to line up with the stone of the corner. Jesus is that cornerstone. Everything we believe and teach about Jesus has to line up with grace. He's the mediator of a better covenant, the covenant of grace. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. Leaders, we have to humble ourselves and realize even if we have to go before the masses and admit, you know, God taught me something this week. I've noticed that when you'll just own up to, hey, you know, God is so good. He taught me something that people are very forgiving. And even those of us that may have known this for a while, we're going to be cheering you on because it has to start with the fathers, the fathers, the mothers, the, the older generation Christian leaders have got to get a revelation of grace and the wisdom of grace. And we can't keep mixing covenants. We can't keep mixing wisdoms because here's what's going to happen. If we start equipping people, because see, once everybody understands this truth, then all the other things that people are seeing will fall into line. But until we get unified in how we approach God, you'll not see, you'll see a constant struggle between church leaders and their people. Because the people are yearning. Everybody has a sense. God loves me. He's never going to stop. And he wants to use me. The thing of it is, we can do good things. We can keep having bread lines and we can keep feeding the masses. But they think, oh, that's just those people being nice. They need to see God. They need to see more than a handout 
sandwich. They need to see God in action. They need to see a people that, that believe that God loves me no matter what, and he's always for me. And out of relationship, they realize that when Jesus, when, when God taught through Moses, or through Paul and said, my earnest desire, this is 1 Corinthians 14, I believe. He said, I, I earnestly desire spiritual gifts, but rather prophesy. When the body of Christ, the true body of Christ, is with their friend and gets a word from God. And that friend says, man, maybe God's real. That's when the awakening happens. Because you see, all the other times we had great awakenings, but it's obvious we had to have more than one great awakening. The church went back to sleep. It was all fear-based. There was a manifest presence where people came to the conclusion, God's real. But it wasn't based on the wisdom of God's grace. And so it petered out. It just... The only thing that's going to change and make this one the greatest one is for the revelation of grace to come come forth but it has to start in the house of god judgment change correction always starts in the house of god if that's true when you speak it oh guys it's true when i speak it <laughs> we're, we're eating our own words here we've always said well judgment must start in the house of god well who's more responsible for the house of god than the leaders We've got to understand that the house of God is not that building on the corner. Again, Hebrew states, whose house, Jesus' house, we are. Those church buildings are meeting places for all of his houses. You might want to write that down. That was pretty good right there. The place on the corner that has the big sign is not the house of God. It's the place that houses the house of God. Buildings are for the house of God. They are not the house of God. And once the service is over, the houses need to go out into the community and reveal God. So, Let's pray for unity in understanding. You see, what I'm calling for is repentance. A change of mind. A change of mind in leadership. We need to not poke fun, not point out, fault find. It's not my purpose at all today. We need to pray for our leaders, those that have influence over the masses, that have the large ministries. We have to pray that we can all come to the unity of the faith. And can you imagine what the world would see if we'd ever be unified in our understanding and equip and empower people to do the work of ministry? We wouldn't have to guilt them. We wouldn't have to threaten them. We wouldn't have to do all the things we do to keep them in the Sunday school and keep them in the different things we need them to do to build our ministries. Now I've gone to meddling. But leaders, you know I'm telling the truth. And it's time that we embrace this great awakening. The shift has begun. But the main shift that must take place is a shift in our understanding and our approach and our relationship with God. Amen. 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 That's pretty much all I have to say about that. Cassie's going to be putting on the screen different ways to reach out to us, Facebook, Twitter. I don't know if we have anything else besides that, but she'll put it on the screen. But I pray that if you have any any questions, anything that you'd like to add to or, or you know, constructive criticisms, um, please get a hold of us. I'd love to hear from you. Um, I just... We all need to learn. I just had this conversation with my granddaughter, 17-year-old senior that 
lost out on her senior year this year. And she's rushing to, to put things together online so she can graduate. And she had to write some papers. And I had really one of the best conversations I've had with her in, in years. She wasn't on her phone. She wasn't, you know, just everywhere. And she was writing this paper about about um, how people argue now. And, and we had a real good conversation about how people nowadays don't listen to one another. And we can't have a true dialogue conversation where you have an opinion that's somewhat, if not completely different than mine. We have to demonize one another and we have to poke fun and we have to, you know, no one's listening. They're just waiting for a, the person to take a breath so we could throw our argument in there. And she and I had a great, it, it was like, oh, my baby girl's growing up. She can really, she's really seeing this, that other people's opinions matter. And we've got to understand as the people of God, that not everyone knows scriptures like we do. And so therefore their, out, their, their view of life is not based on a submission to scripture. But what they've seen us do is we do it when it's convenient. And so we've got to give them something, something real, something real. So I pray I've given everyone something to think about tonight and something to pray about. We need unity in the church before it goes on the outside. I still am wondering, have we been quarantined long enough for a lasting change? And then I'm reminded, son, don't put me in a box. I can do. Don't worry about it. Don't fret. Because we got six, eight months left in 2020, and it can still happen. This is the, the year, the decade of the mouth. It's not begging God, please, God, help us. Stop this. He said for us to speak to the storms. That's the key thing. Prayer movements are good, but let's pray the way we're supposed to as New Covenant Christians, people with authority. Let's speak to these storms. Amen. God bless you. Food for thought. Keep those cards and letters coming. In Jesus' name, amen. Who was it said that? Keep those cards and letters. Right there on the front of the road. That's, That's John Boy and Billy. <laughs> <laughs> there was a character on John Boy and Billy, the radio guys. He was.